uh, we already gave a, an intro to this chapter um, several weeks ago, two weeks ago. So we have a recording of that. You can find it on jewishnevado.com forward slash virtual. Um, I want to go right into the text-based learning. Uh, of course, if you have questions as we, as we go through it, you're welcome to um, either chat it or, of course, just speak it. Uh, one cool thing that I'm just taking out of the chapter is what we're going to see is that there's, just like a tzaddik, there's two types. There's two types of a rasha. A tzaddik is a person who lives inspired on the inside and out, meaning his emotions and his mind, as well as his behavior, are all perfect. And it's in, he's in tune with God every day and all day. So for him, it's not a challenge to do what's right. A rasha is a compromised person, a person who... He, he gives in to weakness, and uh, it's hard for him to control himself. The Bainini is one who maybe on the inside is not perfect, meaning his emotions, he has impulses that are uh, not as um, uh, inspired. But on the outside, on his behavior, he's able to control himself on his thought, speech, and action. And that's a Bainini. But now what we're going to introduce in Chapter 15 is you could also have two types of Bainini's. You could have a Bainini who, according to Tanya's words in the Hebrew, we're going to see is Mitsunan Bativo, which means he's cold-blooded. So for him, it's not such a challenge to do what's right. He's not a tzaddik because he's not inspired, but he's not full of desires and fantasies that are coming uh, up from his impulse, from his inside, from his emotions all day, every day. It's not that hard for him. He's just more cold. He's not as... Um, uh, heated or bo boiled inside to um, be running after his heart's desires. Like I said in a couple of weeks ago, it's like the goody-goody in class who whatever the teacher says to do, he just does because that's what he knows. Um, but we're going to see in Tanya in this chapter, it's pretty cool how the Alter Rebbe says that's a problem. All of us may think that's a wonderful thing. You don't even have challenges. Alter Rebbe is going to say that's not the ideal Bainani. He's not really doing his job. A Bainani is someone who pushes themselves. A Bainani is someone who struggles. That's actually the beauty of the Bainani. We're not a tzaddik. And a tzaddik doesn't struggle. The Bainani does. Part of his greatest success is in his struggle. So if you have a Bainani who's not struggling, the Alter Rebbe says we have to deal with that. And, and we may think that's a great thing. Don't, if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it. Like, leave it the way it is. But the author is going to tell us, no, 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 that's, a, that's not a good place to be at if you're not working on yourself to be better. And if, if it comes easy to you, it's a sign that you're not working on yourself. You always have to work on yourself. If you're swimming and you take a, um, a break, you have to tread. If you stop treading, you sink. A Bainani needs to keep on growing, needs to have that struggle that always propels him upward. And if, he, if it's easy for him, that means he's not propelling himself, and that's a dangerous place. And therefore, what we're going to see in Tanya, it's a pretty cool um, advice. The Alter Rebbe says, if you're not struggling, find the struggle, which means work hard like, um, and expand your horizon to do more where it hurts you a little bit, where it's, it doesn't come easy for you anymore. So you have to find, you have to push the right button to find your harder place that, that, that needs work. In the olden days, the common thing was to study a hundred times. And I don't think I explained it as well in, the, in, 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 in our previous lesson. The reason is in the olden days, that we, had, we have what's called oral, oral law, which is the part of Torah that is, was never written from Moses all the way through the temple times. It was never written. It was just passed down from teacher to student and it, from generation to generation. It was never written. Moshe, Moses, Moshe, actually said, don't write this down because it's the soul of Torah. The oral teachings were just passed down from mouths of teachers to students. But in, around, in, in, around 2,000 years ago, uh, during the times of the temple, when the Romans were destroying our temple, there was one of the great sages, his name was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He was actually simply known as Rabbi. And he realized that if we don't write this down, it's going to be forgotten because the Romans banned us from learning Torah. 
And he felt that if teachers are not teaching anymore, students are not learning anymore, it's going to be forgotten. So he took upon himself the enormous task, the Herculean effort, to collect all the teachings. And he wrote what's known as the Mishnah. Together, later it became known as the Talmud, as it expanded and got elaborated and debated. But all in all, that's when it was written down. But before it was written, the only way teachers taught students was by memory. So the student, in order to make sure that they got it right, they actually reviewed it all a hundred times. They would, the teacher would teach it, and then the students would review it together <clears throat> on their way home, on their way to school, on their way um, in their private uh, sessions. They would study it over a hundred times. But that was normal. That was common. What was not normal, what was the struggle, was to study the hundred and first time. Number 101. So that number 101 is the real study. The first hundred was normal. That's not yet a, a full study from my, from my heart. That's just what we do. The number 101 was the study, was the real learning. That's where the struggle was, to study out of the norm. So for a Bainini, they have to push themselves out of their comfort to keep on growing, to keep on expanding. So that's one of the, uh, I think, an important lesson introduced over here is, is that idea of the Bainini. Let's see. So, oh, I'm going to, I'm sorry for the delay. I'm going to put it up on the uh, screen as well. It might, hold on one second, just bear with me. It might um, start reading it. There's um, an option that it just reads it for you. Uh, we're not going to do that. It's not, a, it's, it's not, not that exciting. Not the book is there, there you go. I told you they, they read it, but it's not as, I, I prefer hearing us read it than, than that guy. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think I got it. So I'm going to share my screen for those who would like to follow along on the screen. I hope everyone, whoops, here we go. Okay, I hope everyone can see it on the screen. <clears throat> Section one, the best version of yourself, avoiding rote worship, meaning doing something just out of rote, out of like a machine. <clears throat> For those that have a coffee or a juice with you, we're going to make a blessing on, on our drink. It's Shehakol, and it goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Shehakol niyah bidbaro. <clears throat> In chapter 13, we learned that the experience of Benini can occur at many levels. There is the default, uninspired Benini, the Benini at study, and prayer, etc. This chapter will broaden the discussion to include various classes of Bainini, differing in the levels of effort they invest. We will learn that it is possible for some Bainanim to maintain their status with very little effort, while others must struggle greatly. This will lead to a discussion about the importance of effort in worship. Right? We all know it's about the effort you put into something. And the Altareb is going to emphasize that very, very strongly in our coming chapter. Based on this definition <clears throat> that a Bainini <clears throat> is a person who never transgresses, we can explain the verse, and this is from Malachi, which was one of the uh, prophets, and we will see again, we will again see the distinction between the Tzaddik and the Rasha, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So what is this repetition? It's saying the tzaddik and the rasha, the one who serves and the one who doesn't. Isn't that the tzaddik and the rasha? The tzaddik serves God and the rasha doesn't. So isn't that self-explanatory? Nothing in Torah is re repetitive. So why would the verse continue something that seems just doubling up uh, the, what was previously said? So isn't the tzaddik and the one who worships God the same thing? The difference between one who serves God and a tzaddik is that one who serves is a verb in the present tense. To you, the use of a verb suggesting that this person is in the ongoing process of worship, namely the war with the Yetzirah, with the evil inclination, to overcome it and chase it away from the body, which is the small city, meaning that the Yetzirah should never influence any of the body's limits. 
So this is an ongoing process. This is a verb of one who serves. That's not a tzaddik. We'll see soon what a tzaddik is. This truly requires a tremendous struggle and effort to constantly fight it with it, which means we have this Yetahara, which is trying to fight for control over the small city, the body, the, the thought, speech, and action, trying to get the, the keys to the driver's seat. And you have to constantly fight it to not give in to what it wants, to not get it, give in to what it wants to do or what it wants to say or what it wants to think about. That's a, that's a constant effort. It's an ongoing process. So it turns out that the one who serves God, who is in the midst of an ongoing struggle, is actually the Benini. But the Tzaddik is usually referred to by a noun, which is a servant of God, which is a, a title, like scholar or king, that he has already achieved. So that's a noun, indicating that the person has already become a scholar or king. Here too, the use of a noun implies that this person has already served and completely finished his labor of fighting with evil in him to the extent that he's driven it away and it's gone from him. That's from the book of Psalms, uh, uh, Psalms number 34. So I'm just going to, before I turn the page on the Kindle edition, uh, just going back to the top, which we had a quote from Malachi, which is actually one of the prophets, where it says, I see the distinction between a tzaddik and a rasha, between one who serves God and one who doesn't serve him. What we're saying here is the tzaddik is not the one who serves God. The tzaddik would be under a different title, a servant of God, in the noun, meaning someone who already achieved that status. But one who is serving is in the verb. It's, a, it's an effort they're putting into now. It's the present, that they're, they're in the middle of their service. And that's not the tzaddik anymore. The tzaddik doesn't have that, con that service that they're doing now. The tzaddik achieved it already. That is referring to the Bainani, the one who is in service, the one who is struggling and overcoming and challenging. That is not the tzaddik. The tzaddik, like we're quoting now at the bottom of the page from Psalms, is like King David, who already attained it. It's gone from him. The evil doesn't exist. He voided it. He neutralized it. He actually transformed it to be an ally. That's a tzaddik. The Benini is in the struggle still. And he is a tzaddik whose heart is empty within him. Again, a quote from King David. This means he has no yetahara on the left side of his heart. So now, as I hope that is, is, is there any question of what we've learned up until now? Okay, awesome. So in the book edition, we're in the middle of 181. In the Kindle, we're toward the top of the page, and it continues like this. Our verse then mentions three categories, but back to this verse from Malachi. Well, it's just parenthetically, one of the, it's interesting, when I moved here in 2012, one of my first Costco trips, um, I was helping my, I, was, I think I was either fixing my glasses or something, but um, one of the optometrists in the, in the glasses section of Costco, his name was Malachi, or Malachi, and he was a Jewish guy who was so excited. He never, he never met a rabbi before. And we still have a very good, he, he doesn't work in this Costco anymore, but we still have a very close friendship. And uh, that was my, the first guy I met with the name Malachi or Malachi, which is uh, the prophet we're quoting here. So in this verse, it mentions three categories. Number one, the tzaddik. Number two, the rasha. And number three, the one who serves God, the benini. But there's also whom does the fourth statement <clears throat> one who does not serve him, represent. We seem to have already covered every category, Tzaddik, Russia, and Benini. So the Tanya will demonstrate that one who does not serve him represents another inferior type of Benini, who makes a negligible effort to maintain a status. With Beninim, there are also two levels one who serves God, and one who does not serve Him. It's such a cool idea to think that you could be a Benini, which means you're perfect on the outside, you're doing everything you need to do, but you're not serving God. You're not considered in service. How is that so? Let's see. The Benini who does not serve God is nevertheless not a Russia, because he has never committed even a minor transgression in his life that has not been atoned for. And he has also observed every mitzvah that was possible for him to observe. 
including the study of Torah, which is equal to them all. And he does not allow his mouth to stop studying, meaning he's constantly doing what he needs to be doing. And at first glance, this, the notion seems absurd. How could someone be a Benini, always distancing the Yetzirah from his thought, speech and action, and not be considered serving God? Either you're in service or you're a Russia. Like, where is that middle ground that you're not a Russia, which means you're in control, but you're, you're still a Benini, but you're not in service? How does that work? So it's like such an uh, interesting concept to wrap our head around. Um, Let me turn the page. Here we go. But despite absolute mastery over thought, speech, and action, this Bainini is classified as one who does not serve God for a simple reason. This is a powerful word. Because he is not actively fighting his Yetzirah at all to overcome it. This means he is not making use of the godly light which shines on, on his divine soul within his brain to empower himself to rule over the urges of his heart as described above chapter 13. The Bainini does not serve God, or sorry, this Bainini does not serve God because he is not actively at war with his Yetzirah. He does not bother to employ the techniques we discussed in chapter 13, which is to maintain control of his animal soul. So this is the fourth category that the Torah in Malachi quotes. They have the Tzaddik, who's a servant of God. You have the Rasha, who is weak and not doing what he's supposed to be doing, slipping. Then you have two categories of Benini, the one who is serving God and the one who is not. The one who is struggling and fighting with his Yetzirah <clears throat> and the one who is not at struggle, is not in service. He's not making use of that divine light that's shining in him. He's not actively fighting the Yetzirah. So, but if the, so that's this category of a Bainani. But if the Bainani, by definition, has not eliminated the deep core of his animal soul, how can he afford not to fight with it? He has evil inside, and he's not fighting. Why does he not stumble in sin? So that's a great question. Imagine you have these, you have a Yetzirah, but you're, you're fine. That's, how, how does that work? How, does it, how could you reconcile those two things together? So listen to these words. It's pretty cool. Because in this case, his Yetzirah doesn't challenge him at all to draw him away from his study or his worship. So he doesn't have to fight it at all. How could that be? Why would, uh, what would cause the Yetzirah to be benign like this? The causes could be either, for example, a person whose inherent nature is to study constantly. He's a studious scholarly type. So for him to be in the book of Torah is not a struggle. He actually enjoys it. He's academic. He enjoys the study. So he never has that distraction or that pull to leave the, the book. Due to an abundance of black bile. Uh, bile, actually someone could help me with the definition, but I'm pretty sure bile means uh, sadness. If someone could um, help me with the definition. I think of it as anger. Oh, bile is anger. So what's black bile? What's, is that an expression? It seems in quotes. Is anyone, is anyone familiar with that? Well, well, there were four humors that, you know, the very ancient doctors, there was, I forget what the other ones were. I think there was another color bile. I don't know that it has anything other than a metaphorical meaning, really. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the black bile would be more like you're saying anger, like that I think dark so. side. I okay. think so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, which leads to an, 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 uh, to an analytical and serious temperament, according to the ancient science, a uh, uh, perfect, like you said, uh, um, Isabel, of uh, humoralism, which is mentioned in the Zohar, which is pretty cool that it's an ancient thing, but from already 2,200 years ago from the Zohar, it's already mentioned. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, and see, let's see. The Greeks had four humors. Awesome. Thank you, Shira. So... It's a, before even the times of the Greeks, it was already mentioned in the Torah of, of the, of, um, in Hebrew, it's called marash chora, which means more of a darker nature, uh, more serious, okay? 
So for this person who's more of a serious temperament, the idea of studying, he never, he's not a jokester and he's not, um, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. Let's see further how we're going to quote this. Hold on a second, let me turn the page again. Whoops. Here we go. As well as a person who does not have a wrestle with a strong desire, if, for, if it's a man, a desire to be with woman, with women, uh, let's see, just say the English, because he is a passionless by nature. So for him, he doesn't have many drives of sexual desire, of, of lust. So for him to do, to be um, uh, always with integrity and honest is not even a struggle for him. And likewise, with other worldly pleasures, he naturally lacks a strong feeling of enjoyment. He could be eating a delicious, um, if you're um, uh, either a steak or if you're vegan, think of a delicious um, uh, vegetable that you saute. Uh, and for him, he doesn't have, like he'll, think, he'll say thank you to the, to the chef or to his wife or whoever's making the food, but it doesn't excite him that he's eating something delicious. He's just more cold nature. He doesn't have that passion. And, you know, like I have a cousin who's so into his wine, it's incredible. Like if you give him a nice bottle of wine, like he gets so excited. And actually I, I remember uh, the first time, he's Adina's cousin. So the first time I went to him for Shabbos, he's really into his wine. So to impress me as the new groom joining the family, he brought out an exquisite bottle. Until today, I don't, I try to make as if I'm a connoisseur because I have some French blood in me from my mother. But honestly, I, don't, I, can't, I can't tell the difference between a good bottle and not. So I didn't know if this bottle is worth $4.99 or $4.99. So I, I, I make Kiddush. And traditionally, as Hasidim, when, if anyone has been to our home for Shabbos or Kiddush uh, on, in Shul, um, when we fill up our cup for Kiddush, our Kiddush cup, we actually overflow it, meaning some of it spills out. He, he couldn't take it. He was going crazy that I would waste such good wine in overflowing it. And he was, he was like, not, he, he wasn't angry, <laughs> but you could just see that he was getting all, all into it as I was pouring it. He was like watching it spill over. So that's someone who has passion, whether it's in his wine or whatever else. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it, it's the sign of struggle. It's a sign of there's, um, there's tension there. He, he knows what's the right thing to do, but he has a desire for something else. So that's one type of bainini. That's the person who's struggling, serving God. But over here, we're talking about the type of bainini that is not struggling, either because he's studious, so the idea of studying Torah is easy, or he's more cold nature, which means he's passionless, so he doesn't have a desire, whether sexual desires or um, otherworldly pleasures. I hope I'm making sense in it, but let's just see a little further. All Yetzirahs are not the same, and some put up a weak fight. While a minimal level of love and reverence of God is still necessary to stay on track, those emotions could come naturally without the need for major spiritual work. Such a case is called one who does not serve God. It's, it's such a cool idea. You know, I, I, as Isabel mentioned, we're giving this positivity class on Monday night. And some people say, I get this often. Some people, you know, they, they would tell us, oh, we, I light Shabbos candles, but it's not a big deal because you guys do it every week. So like, it's not that impressive. And I say on the contrary, for us, it's like second nature. Sundown comes, we light Shabbos candles on Friday. There's no struggle. Should I do Shabbos this week or not? For us, it's just, that's who we are. That's what we do. For someone who is like a novel idea or they have so much going on that it's so hard to pull themselves away from, that's a struggle for them to light Shabbos candles. It's a struggle for them to observe Shabbos. It's, it brings a whole new level of impression, of, of struggle that we are so at, in awe of. So for me, it's a weak fight. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not that it's struggle. And, but the idea of putting up of a real struggle, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spiritual work that is incredible. So the one who is not a struggle for, that's the one who's not serving God, even though he's a Bainini. And therefore, we're in the middle of the page on the Kindle, or 
Uh, I lost track of the, uh, in the book. Oh, it's on the top of 183 in the book, if you're looking. And therefore, since the Zietzahara offers a negligible pole, he doesn't need to meditate too much on the greatness of God. For his faculty of cognition, which is Bina, to produce a sense of recognition, which is Das, as we discussed in chapter 3, and consequently, the Das gives rise to reverence of God in his mind and trepidation in his heart, so as to be careful not to transgress any of the prohibitions. All this is largely unnecessary, since his Yetzirah is so weak. So just to explain this a little bit uh, with a little bit more um, elaboration, because it's an important idea. One of the main things of Tanya is to remind us, to teach us, that whatever we think about will develop the feeling toward it. So whether we think about something um, with, with positive thoughts, it will develop a feeling of love. If we think of something with negative thoughts, we'll develop a, a feeling of fear or hatred, <clears throat> animosity or jealousy. But it starts in the mind. What we're saying here is, for this Bainani, that there's no pull towards his Yetzirah, he also doesn't have to focus his meditation so hard on God. And therefore, his development of feeling of reverence, of love, is not going to be that strong either for God. <clears throat> Neither does he need to meditate to stir up love of God in his heart, as I just mentioned, to inspire himself to connect to God through observing the positive commandments, including the study of the Torah, which is equal to them all, since he finds it possible to observe Jewish law without a concern, without a concerted effort. Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So when, when it says one who does not serve God, but you're lighting the Shab Shabbat candles, yeah, and yeah. obviously it's easy for you because that's what you do, but surely you're also having this total feeling of joy and excitement for bringing in Shabbat, which sure. is all about connecting with God. So on one level, I know I, I, I can kind of understand the, yeah, the struggle means that you really have to work on yourself and, 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 and really observe something or raise yourself to a higher vibration um, and show your commitment. But then surely there's also the part that, of you that is flowing, that's so connected to God, that brings you so much joy, that For it sure. is effortless. So what, sure. what, can you speak to that? Yeah, so keep that going, that effortless part in lighting Shabbos candles, keep that up. But now find a place where you need to bring in effort to add to it. So whether if you're lighting, let's say, the Shabbos candles already, maybe add an extra prayer during the time of Shabbos candles. And if that's easy for you and that's just fun and there's no pull, find a place where it will take some struggle, which means maybe after lighting Shabbos candles, take 10 minutes to study the parasha or take um, uh, five minutes um, to sit by the candles and just meditate. Whatever it is that will make it a little bit harder and there's a little bit more of a struggle, that's an important uh, facet to uh, the Bainini's success. And, and the reason is, and I guess we'll continue reading, but once it's, it's easy for you and effortless, it doesn't mean stop doing it. Continue doing it with effort, without effort but find a place where you have to, there is going to be a grind and it's not as easy because that's where your meditation needs to be in place because it's a, it's a, it's an effort and that effort will develop from the mind into the heart to draw yourself in, in a much more engaged way um, with, with um, more effort. Uh, we'll see. I think we'll, um, Oh, actually I'll tell you in our family and, um, and uh, Shira is bringing it up, rushing from work to light candles. I'll tell you, for us, it's easy to light Shabbos candles every week. So you know what we do to be a little bit harder? Adina is actually amazing at this. We try to light Shabbos candles five minutes earlier. It seems so easy. Okay, fine. If, if candle lighting is, let's say, at 8.13, which was this past Friday in Novato, to light at 8.05 is not that hard. I could guarantee you it's, it's so hard. Because whenever you have a certain time you need to do it by, Every minute before, especially the last minutes, especially as Jews, we're busy to the last minute um, uh, because we wait to the last minute. It's just what we do. So the idea of trying to finish it all and bring in Shabbos five minutes earlier, or let's say on the other hand, if Shabbos is easy for you, at the end of Shabbos, let's say this past week, it ended, I think, at 916. 
p.m. on Saturday. So it's already pretty late as it is. Spend another five minutes after Shabbos would have ended to just remain in that period of Shabbos. That's where it would take more effort. That's where, that, that's a beautiful place to struggle in. And from that struggle, you'll see amazing results. And when that gets easier, find another place where you need to find your struggle. I guess we'll see it more in Tanya. Maybe the, I didn't see it inside this book yet. So maybe he'll come up with other um, uh, examples. But that's just one that actually is coming up to mind. Uh, Maddie, as you're, as you're mentioning, Shabbos candles. Yeah. Does, uh, so does that mean that it's um, uh, being mindful versus being an automatic pilot? Exactly. Instead of it just coming from rote, so let's say prayers, eventually, when you pray over and over again, and you're pretty good at Hebrew, or whatever language you're praying in, eventually it just becomes natural. So you don't even have to put your mind in so much into the words, because the words are coming out. So that's called praying out of rote. Your, your mind and heart is not in it. When you take a moment, and you're going to say, no, 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 I'm going to focus on every word, and I'm going to spend six minutes reading this paragraph, even though I could rattle it off in 40 seconds, that takes effort and that takes patience and that takes mindfulness and that yeah that makes sense the ideal that makes thing. sense so thank you of course so technically you could be a bainani without that effort but it's not serving god you're not doing this you're not an evid which is the hebrew word for you're not a servant you're not you're not working on yourself you're just doing the job and it's effortless whether because i'm I don't have passions for other things or I'm studious. It comes natural because I'm more nerdy, whatever it is. Find the place where you need to put in the effort a little more. And to just answer Yaakov, uh, to struggle in morning prayer is a good thing. So it's a, it's a great question because actually Yaakov, in the morning prayer, we ask God four words. It says, Don't bring me to the, uh, to the threshold of temptation. Don't bring me to the state of challenge. It's actually a prayer, and it's a debatable thing because over here is saying challenge is a good thing. Put in the struggle, find the struggle, and, and work with it. But on the other hand, ideally, we don't want to be around any temptations, right? You shouldn't put yourself, if a person is an alcoholic, they shouldn't be putting themselves in a room full of people drinking if it's going to be hard for them. Don't put yourself in that situation. Um, so, but I have a question about that, if yeah. I may. It's a, it's, a, it's a big topic. I know. I opened the can of worms. <laughs> so, um, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I, I know that when we start the morning prayers, we, you know, we like to fill in everything. We're not supposed yeah. to let anything interfere with our prayers. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, my, I, I guess my question is, uh, um, can we wait a little bit? Like, can I wait for my wife to go to work and then do prayers, but she doesn't go to work until like 8.30 in the morning, right? I don't have a private room that I could just go into and pray, and she loves to come out and ask me questions in the morning because she wakes up like an hour before me, right? So she's already awake, and I'm still wiping off the sleep. But <laughs> but uh, um, um, I get a little, little concerned about, you know, going to do the, the prayers in the morning and late yeah. to fill in yeah. first thing in the morning when she's still here because she'll come out and ask me questions or, you know, and she doesn't, uh, I, I don't know why, but she, it's, she's not used to the, the whole concept that I have to do the whole thing all at once without being interrupted because yeah. I have to have a, a, a mind, uh, a, a mindset and, you know, be into it. So I, I, I struggle with, you know, uh, I want to do it first thing when I wake up, but, you know, I, I don't want to be interrupted. And so if I wait till later, then I feel bad because I didn't do it first yeah. thing. Yeah. So, and I've heard so many different, uh, yeah. so many different things on it, you know, and one person says, oh, no, you have to. And the other person says, look, get your coffee first, drink your coffee, you know, and so I don't, I, I get yeah, awesome. So in a, in a nutshell, we could talk about it more later, um, uh, but I do want to answer that. I do, I do want to address it by telling you, Yaakov, there's nothing more important than your relationship with your spouse. It's called Shalom well, Bayit. And the Torah is put on hold for the sake of Shalom Bayit, which means yeah. that if it's hard for you not to pray in the morning, that's your struggle. Spend the time with your wife, drink a cup of coffee with her, answer all her questions and be patient in it, and then go do the prayers. And I, I do that every morning. My kids have to go to school. I mean, not now, but during the school year and not in Zoom era. But usually my kids, we have to pack lunches and bring them to carpool. 
I, um, I bring them to a stop so they get picked up. I do that all before prayers because it's, it's, I have to be present for my children and then I'll be able to be more in, in my, uh, present in my, um, um, uh, in, my, in, my, in my prayers. And as sure as coffee plus wife is a good life. Awesome, yes, well said. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, and then yeah. ju actually just, uh, just uh, I'll, I wanna elaborate on that one more, one more, one more step. Um, and if, you, if anyone heard this from me before, um, you, could, you could mute it if it's, uh, if it's coming out of your ears already. But uh, one of the things that um, is a matter of contention in Chabad or in any Orthodox circle is that we have a mechitza uh, during prayers. A mechitza is a partition separating the men and the women. And it's been, it, that's been the way since temple times and before. All right? That's just how, how Hashem set it up. And a lot of people in 20th and 21st century have a, have a problem with it. And I could understand it. They, you want to sit with your family. I'm not going to go through the entire discussion now, but Judaism is a very much a family-based relationship. It's, a, it's all about Judaism is right now, Judaism is continuing, even though shul, synagogue, services on Shabbos is not open. Because Judaism is 95% in the home. It's around the Shabbos table. It's on your living room couch. It's, on your, it's in your kitchen. It's in your bedroom. That's where Judaism is. There's 5-10% that we pray, and we pray with a minion, etc. But Judaism is, is, okay, so I don't want to elaborate on this too much. I want to get back in Tanya. But um, we put a mechitza. And a lot of people say, well, does God really care if I'm going to sit with my spouse when I'm praying? Like, is God really that jealous that he's scared that I can't focus on him if I'm with my wife? And it's actually a beautiful response. It's actually what God is telling us. The reason why we sit with the mechitza separating is actually God is saying, if you're sitting with your spouse, I don't want you to talk to me. I want you to be focused on your spouse. If you're with her, sitting next to her, don't be busy focusing on me. Be busy focusing on him or her. And therefore, God says, for those 5% of your week, I want you to be present and focused on a, on a prayer. But if you're with your spouse, God's saying, I want you to be focused on your spouse. Therefore, to allow you to be in that in, in tune or in that zone, Hashem is saying, put up a mechitza so you, you don't have to feel like you need to be in a, relation, in, um, in a discussion right now with your wife. You should do that before and after. But take some time to, you know, as the, the mask in the plane, they t tell you put on your own mask first so you could be able to support and help others with their mask. Um, okay, you're welcome, Yaakov. There's a lot more to talk about on that subject, but um, we, we, we should definitely elaborate on that. But let's continue um, inside. Yeah, so we finished this page. It's not, it's not a struggle for him, and therefore what happens is he doesn't have to meditate on it so much. And what happens as a result is he doesn't uh, focus on his meditation and his love for God. Okay, so at the core of Tanya's worldview are two convictions. A, that you possess, let me just make sure I'm, I'm on the right page here, yeah. A, that you possess an inherent love of God, which may be dormant but is always present. B, that through meditation on the greatness of God and contemplative prayer, you can stir up a much more powerful love. So, let's see what that means. The benini, uh, sorry, the dormant love, which is A, that we possess, an inherent love, takes relatively little effort to awaken. The love which you stir up yourself, which is the B, the meditation, is a huge ongoing struggle for someone who is not a tzaddik. Okay, so let me just explain this paragraph, because really, by the way, this paragraph, if I'm understanding correctly, that we just read, is really a, a, a foretaste of some upcoming chapters from 16 all the way through 24. It's telling us, number one, that you could stir up feelings in your heart of love for God and, and overcoming the Yetzirah by your meditation, coming up with things to meditate on, on your relationship with God, on the greatness of God. But then there's also realizing that inherently you already possess a love for God inside, and you just have to awaken it. Now, that A, the, the, the way of inheriting uh, that inherent love, 
is something I already have, so therefore it's easier to awaken. The meditation part is something that I have to stir up, and it, it takes a lot more effort. So the Benini who does not serve God receives this title because he relies on dormant love. Rather, the Yetzirah of this Benini is so negligible that all he needs to avoid its all he needs to avoid its allures is the dormant love found in the heart of all Israel, who are called lovers of His name. Therefore, this Benini cannot in any way be called one who serves, because the existence of his dormant love in his soul was not brought about by him, nor is it in any way his achievement. Rather, it is our spiritual inheritance from our patriarchs to the whole of Israel, as, we, uh, as will be discussed below in chapters 18 and 44. Making use of the inherent dormant love does not count as real spiritual work, because it was not earned through any effort in the first place. Rather, it is a natural proclivity of the soul, which was inherited from the patriarchs. So this is a really cool thing. Each and every one of us as Jews have an inheritance. Just like a baby, even um, that is a day old and didn't do anything productive besides for um, make a, have a diaper and, and nurse, that baby earns every dollar of a parent's inheritance. They could be the next of kin. They didn't have to do anything to earn it. It's just automatic. They have an inheritance. Each and every one of us, by being the children of our patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Mitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, we have an inheritance of love for God. How? By birth. Just it's there. Or by conversion. Actually, it says that a person who converts, a lot of people choose the Jewish name of Avraham or Sarah because they, when you a person converts, they... Um, possess and they, they inherit this natural love for God, even though it wasn't something they were born with. It's an amazing thing. So what we're saying here is, by nature, we all possess this love for God. So the Bainani that's not serving God, he has this love already inside, and he just wakes it up whenever he needs to do the right thing. But it's not hard for him. He relies on this love that he already possesses, that he didn't have to work for. Now, we all know that a person who grows their own tomatoes and eats it, besides for being healthier and organic, etc., it just tastes better than when you buy that same tomato from a store because you earned it, you worked for it, you planted it, you sowed it, you watered it, whatever. So this dormant love that I didn't have to do anything to earn, it's not that power, it's, it's a strong love, but it's not that, um, it doesn't take that much effort to bring it up. It's natural. You have it. So our discussion so far of one who does not serve God has been centered around the Benini, whose Yetzirah never really troubled him. Now we turn to another case. The Benini, who did have a bothersome Yetzirah, but has regulated it through disciplined practice so that it no longer bothers him. Worshiping God has now become his second nature. So this is a great thing, Maddie, as you were saying before about rote. So we're going to really address it now. And this is where what I was saying before about studying the 101st time, that idea or um, learning um, or, or taking Shabbos in five minutes earlier, this is where it's really going to come in. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea. So one way, the Benini who doesn't serve God, either it's because by nature he's, he doesn't have inclinations to... Um, uh, desires that are inappropriate. So it's easy for him to serve God. He doesn't have to work hard. He just relies on that inherent love. He knows it's the right thing. He loves God, and therefore he just does it. But over here, what happens if it was hard for a person? But by, by doing it over and over again, they regulated themselves. We all know that you could train yourself to do a certain thing. For example, um, a person at the beginning could be going jogging, and it's really hard on them, and they're huffing and puffing. After a while, they get used to it. After a while, they can't go a day without their job. They go crazy without it because they regulated themselves that their body needs it. So for a person who it was, they had desires and temptations and inclinations that are inappropriate, but they train themselves that no longer is it bothersome for them to be doing the right thing. So now doing the right thing, worshiping God, doing the mitzvah and prayer is second nature. So it was hard for them, 
they are passionate, whatever, for other things, but they regulated themselves. So what about that? What class, what category is that being any under? Is it the person who's struggling or is it the person that's cold? So the same, we're on the second paragraph in the online edition. Um, and we're on 184 in the uh, book edition. The same classification of a Bainani who's who does not serve God is also applicable to a person who doesn't have a natural disposition to study all the time, but has nevertheless trained himself to study with extreme persistence, and it has become normal for him a second nature. Many observant Jews share this kind of experience. Listen to this. This is great. In one way or another, for example, if you have kept kosher for a long time, you might have reached a point where you are not seriously tempted to eat non-kosher food. But that's not because you have transformed your deep core and eliminated the Yitzhahara. It's just that the discipline of keeping kosher has become second nature to you. To you. For him, the Benini by second nature, this dormant love is enough to maintain his level without any extra effort. Unless he wants to study more than he is accustomed, in which case he will have to invest effort and become one who serves God, as we shall see in the following section. In conclusion, this is a good way to um, get a summary. A person who has disciplined himself to the point that his Yetahara no longer bothers him might easily confuse himself with a tzaddik because he doesn't have struggle. It's easy for him. But what we're going to learn is, but he is far from the level of tzaddik. The deep core of his animal soul has not been transformed to love God and detest evil. His Yetzirah fails to trouble him merely because it has been tamed by years of disciplined worship. He hasn't really changed inside. If he had, he would experience a profound pleasurable love of God and detest evil. So a litmus test to see um, if you're an atzadik or not is see if you really detest anything that is wrong, anything that is evil, anything that is um, um, not for God, if you enjoy it, but you could hold back from it, that just means you're normal. It means you're a bainini. If it's easy for you to hold back, it just means you're a bainini that doesn't struggle. But that doesn't make, make you a tzaddik yet. The hallmark of the bainini who does not serve God is stagnation. This is like what I was telling you before about treading water and stopping. You're stagnant. He doesn't sin. His thought, speech, and action follow God's will. He has and he has no strong urge to do otherwise. But there is no growth in his worship. His nature, or second nature, enables him to function at what for most people would be a very high level. And while that is generally a good thing, which means you're doing the right thing, you're behaving, and you're, you're, you're doing good, still it has a disadvantage too. It holds him back from growing. That is why he is classified as one who does not serve God, because service implies an active mode of worship and he is basically passive. So let's just answer some question. Um, but does a tzaddik ever really think he is a tzaddik? One of the hallmarks is humility, right? Um, good question, Shira. A tzaddik, that's a... Uh, um, if you remember in chapter 1, and we, we addressed it, I think, in chapter 13 and, and 14, we learned about Rabbah. Rabbah was a Talmudic sage who was a tzaddik, but he confused himself as a Benini because he never stopped being in the moment of Torah to know what would happen if he's challenged. But he was at the level of tzaddik, and he looked at himself as a Benini. Um, but I think many tzad, uh, in plural, it's called tzaddikim, or a tzaddik, would know that they're at this level. Humility doesn't mean you... Um, um, negate the truth. Humbleness, um, let, let's just take Moses as an example, and Shira, I'm pretty sure we, we discussed this at our parasha discussions on Shabbos. Moses knew he was a tzaddik. But at the same time, we know he was very humble. So he didn't go around saying, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody, I'm not a, I'm not a good person, I'm not a tzaddik. He knew he was a tzaddik. But his humility made him realize that I'm, I've, I've been given very special gifts. And if someone else were given those gifts, they would actually be attaining an even higher level. He realized that he's special, that he could speak to God and he was given special gifts. 
but that humility did, didn't um, confuse him on knowing the truth that he was a tzaddik. I hope that answers that question. Um, but will a true tzaddik ever consider himself a tzaddik? I think so. I think so. I guess, Yaakov, that's similar to Shira's question. That's interesting. It's great that you both um, asked that question. Um, I think so. I think a tzaddik knows he's a tzaddik. I have to double check that. I've never reached that level. So uh, when I reach it, I'll, 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 I'll fill you in on what it feels like. But um, Isabel, I'm pretty sure you're there already. Isabel, what does it feel like being a tzaddik? <laughs> uh, okay, so Feels good. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so I'm actually just going to squeeze in a little bit more in section two, just because I've been quoting this Talmud over and over again. So I finally got to it. I just want to start. I want to at least uh, get a taste for it. Section two: Why effort matters. So what we learned until now is it's dangerous to be in a state of stagnation. You could be a bainani, but if you're stagnant in a bainani, which means you're not putting effort or serving. You need to push yourself. Now let's see where that comes from. Why effort matters. Based on this, we can explain the Talmud statement. The one who serves God refers to a person who reviews his studies 101 times. And one who does not serve him refers to a person who reviews his studies only 100 times. That's from the Talmud Chagiga. As the Talmud itself asks, after reviewing a lesson 100 times, a single extra review would seem to be relatively insignificant. Why would that make all the difference? Why should this earn a student the venerable title of one who serves God? It's a one review difference. Because in those days, it was normal to review each lesson a hundred times. Your level of worship doesn't determine if you are serving God or not. What matters is if you are extending yourself beyond what is normal and comfortable to you. If it's normal, to review your studies 100 times, then do it 101 times. That's considered service. So if it's normal for you to keep Shabbos from 8.13 to 9.16 or whatever sunset and, and uh, when the stars come out for Saturday night, that Shabbos, do it an extra five minutes. And that's where you'll see effort. And that's where it, it brings in an, a, a growth in your service. As the Talmud itself offers an analogy of the donkey driver's rental market, where the donkeys could be hired for 10 Persian miles. I don't know what exactly um, a Persian mile in Hebrew is called a parsa, which I'm pretty sure is um, two thirds of a mile in our uh, language. So I would say maybe it's like a kilometer, interesting. I'm not sure. For one zuz, which is a silver coin. Whereas for 11 Persian miles, just one mile more, they charge double, which is two zuzim, two Persian zuz two silver coins, because that extra mile extended them beyond their norm. What exactly is added here by the analogy from the donkey rental market? There seems to be no fresh insight here. The key point here is that the donkey is rented. It never becomes yours. That resembles the relationship between you and your animal soul. It may have all sorts of urges that you cannot fully control and own, but you can hire the animal soul to serve God. Wow. Okay, let me just uh, really cool. Let me finish the next paragraph and try to explain this and we'll end the class with this. And this addresses an underlying question we have in this chapter. If I never fully transform and own my animal soul, can I really be considered a serving God? The answer offered here by the Tanya is yes, you can rent your animal soul in the service of God. And as long as you extend your animal soul your animal beyond its natural comfort zone, it will be considered real service. This, by the way, is from Notes on Tanya, which is from the Rebbe. And I just want to explain this a little bit more, um, and we'll end with this. So I'm going to stop sharing just so everyone can see me a little bigger. Can everyone see me? Okay, I hope so. Um, so just to explain what we just learned, is what we're learning today is the struggle. Some people look at themselves and say, I'm struggling all day. This is crazy. The Alter Rebbe says that means you're healthy. That means you're growing. That means you're pushing yourself. The second you're stagnant, that's when it's crazy. That's when it's dangerous. You can still be a bainani, but if you're not pushing yourself and it's not hard for you, you're stagnant and you need to put the effort in. That's the source of your growth. That's the source of your development from your mind to your heart, not just relying on that love that I have already, but working with the meditations of the mind that develops a feeling of love and respect from the heart, reverence from the heart, 
that's a sign of enhancing your relationship. Why is that so important? We know from the Talmud. The Talmud talks about um, uh, learning 100 times versus learning 101 times. That one time extra is what counts the most. That's what's considered real Torah study. Nowadays, we don't have that same um, uh, con condition of studying 100 times. But it's, it's the, it's, in those days, that, that was what was normal, to study 100 times, to keep it in your mind, in the memory. So that 101st time is the real effort. And that's what's considered learning. That's when you're, you've learned. Similar to the donkey, where you could rent a donkey to travel 10 miles for one zuz, or 11 miles for two zuz. Double the price for one mile. Because that was out of the normal. That was out of the ordinary. So that proves the point of the Talmud, that studying that one extra time is where it's the prize. That's the biggest effort. But the Rebbe, in the, the last paragraph, he explains something beautiful. That analogy that the Tanya brings is, is bringing up such an important point. It's about rental. And it's a little detail in that story that it's the person who's renting the donkey because a person can have a question. Ultimately, I don't own this. Ultimately, I don't feel good all the time. Ultimately, my animal soul wants its own thing and I want my own thing. So every now and then, I could rent the animal soul and get it on board to put in an effort and to be excited about doing the mitzvah of Shabbos candles or to fill in or whatever it is mitzvah I'm doing, but it's not mine. I don't own it. It's rented. It's something outside of me. So the, what we're learning from this example is when you rent that donkey, or in our case, when you rent your animal soul to be on board and to go in your direction, you're actually fulfilling that incredible part. Let's just get the words again. Uh, if you're renting that animal soul, you're extending your animal beyond its natural comfort, that's considered a real service. Even if it's just renting it, which means the animal soul is not fully on board. It's not a tzaddik that it's neutralized and transformed. It's just rented. You're borrowing or you're renting that animal soul to do what you want just for today, to be excited about a mitzvah, to go above your norm and to be and to extend yourself. That is considered service. So just in conclusion, we know that the, the, from the quote from Malachi, there's the tzaddik, the rasha, the one who serves God, and the one who doesn't. The, the tzaddik is not the one who serves God, even though when you're reading that verse, it may seem it, it's a pattern and it adds up to each other. He's saying, no, those are four categories. You have a tzaddik who's already a servant of God, which means he already attained that status. It's not hard for him anymore. You have a rasha who gives in, and it's not only hard for him, he doesn't, he, he's weak. But then you have two categories of a Benini. The Benini who is serving and the Benini who's not serving, which means he's still doing the right thing, but either he's doing it because it's easy for him because he's studious or he doesn't have passions and desires and lust, or it's easy for him because um, uh, it's second nature. He trained himself and now it's already happening by rote. So the Alter Rebbe says, you've got to push yourself. You can't be stagnant. You have to learn that 101st time. You have to go that extra mile. You have to rent that donkey to go in your thing, to push yourself to the point where um, uh, you're focused on that growth and you can't remain stagnant. Um, it makes me think that the Rebbe always wanted people to do more, challenge yourself. That's exactly it. The Rebbe, even if a person was doing everything right, but the Rebbe says you got to be doing more because if you're remaining in that constant uh, cycle, it's a, it's a place of stagnation. Um, Toda for class teaching us. Thank you, Rabbi. Awesome. Cool. All right. So we'll end with that. Have a great week. Uh, make sure you find a, uh, meditate on what you can find this week that you're going to, even if it's normal and easy for you to be doing, for some people, it's really easy for them to have a good relationship with their sibling because they, their sibling is so nice to them. For some people, it's a little harder to have a good relationship with their sibling or with their parent or with their spouse. Put in a little bit extra effort to be more patient. And that's, uh, so if it's easy for you, find an extra step where um, it, you could find a place of, of tension in it being a little harder and focus on that. All right, we'll end with that. And uh, you could all find your own example of how to do it. Any questions before we conclude? Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.